Hello, good afternoon. Um, we'll give people just a couple more minutes to join in. I know we're expecting just a few more folks. Um, so thank you all for joining and um, we'll get started in just a, just a bit. It is exciting to see some familiar names here and um, hope that you're going to find today's session um, really helpful in the work that you're doing. Again, giving it just another minute or so, and then we'll get this uh, party started. We're going to go ahead and get started today. I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, and I um, will we'll just start our process. We're still um, hoping that we're going to have a couple more people join. Um, but I appreciate you being on time. And so in honor of that, I am going to go ahead and just get us started. And I'm trying to get my screens lined up the way I'm supposed to. Okay, there we go. So um, thank you for joining us today. Our topic for today is the op-ed and editorial board engagement. I am Shelley Hogan, uh, the Field Media Advocacy Director here at the American Heart Association, and I will be joined shortly by Tara Hall, the Field Media Advocacy Lead for the Tobacco End Game here at the AHA. Um, just as we are um, getting started, I want to go through a few housekeeping um, and meeting expectation notes. This meeting is currently being recorded. Uh, the recording will be emailed to participants with any slides or other materials within a week. Uh, we will be taking questions in the chat today. So um, feel free to put any questions into the chat to everyone or chat the presenter privately. Um, we'll try to address all questions before the training concludes. If at any time during the session you need technical support, just chat tech support from the pull down menu. Uh, we ask that in all large sessions that you keep your microphone muted unless you are being called upon to participate. Being on camera is always optional. 
We do have closed captioning available during this meeting. You can turn on that service in the menu bar. The recording will also be sent with captions. We really appreciate your feedback and value that. So at the conclusion of this webinar, you are going to have a short evaluation that we'll ask you to fill out. We do ask that all participants have respect for one another and allow grace for one another during today's training. Um, please experience this training how you learn best and let us know if there's anything we need to know. Um, that said, um, we're hoping to have this wrapped up within 45 minutes today. Um, and our goal is for you to gain confidence in building relationships with editors and journalists while you're also learning the basics of writing op-eds, um, letters to the editor, and conducting an editorial board visit. And I'm gonna take a peek really quickly to see if Tara has been able to join us yet. Have we seen Tara yet, Andrea? Not yet. Okay, well, I'm just gonna keep moving forward and um, we will uh, continue this and hopefully I will, will be able to, to do anything that she's not available for without any problem. Um, as I said, introducing us, um, I'm Shelly Hogan. Um, I am based out of Seattle, Washington. Um, I provide technical assistance and media advocacy strategy to um, the American Heart Association state and community advocacy campaigns, as well as to other nonprofits across the country. Um, and I'm based in Seattle. Tara uh, meanwhile, has previously worked as the media advocacy manager for Voices for Healthy Kids. Um, just a little over a month ago, she moved over to this new position as media advocacy lead uh, for the Tobacco End Game with the AHA, and she is based in Tampa, Florida. Um, Tara got her start in public policy um, just about three years ago in change, but before that she actually worked as a journalist. And so I'm gonna be sharing some of the tips and the um, skills that, that she brought from, from that experience uh, for working with the media and specifically with editors. So some really good best practices on how to engage with editors and with other journalists. Um, is to start out just by following them on social media. So you find their social media pages and you like and you follow them um, so that you can stay updated on what they're working on. Many journalists actually use their social media not just to share their news stories or stories they care about, but also as a way to share a little bit and gain a little insight into their personal lives. So oftentimes just by following even their professional accounts, you can learn if they have children or grandchildren, what are they passionate about, um, what kind of hobbies do they have? And then the other thing that can be real helpful around this is you can find out if you have friends, colleagues in common, or maybe an alma mater. So these are all ways to just start a conversation. Um, once you make a connection and you're ready to, to send them um, a story or an op-ed, make sure that you add in that kind of personal touch to your pitch. Um, if they have children, make your pitch about how a policy can help families. Um, in outside of that, take the opportunity to provide feedback on their stories. So when they write something you like, let them know. Um, you can tag them on social media or you can send them an email. Um, or I know as crazy as this sounds, you can actually pick up the phone and call them. Um, in some of your own uh, always add your own commentary so you know that you're authentic. Um, Tara referred to the fact that when she worked in public relations, she always wrote thank you notes to journalists covering the issues we were working on and then provided them with follow-up resources that could be helpful in any stories they do on that issue in the future. You can also um, do things like set up a desk side or a newsroom meeting. Um, 
again, in the time of COVID, that may not be as simple as it was um, just a couple of years ago, but it's still an opportunity, even if you're not technically face-to-face, -face, but have that opportunity to, to set up a Zoom call, something where you are, having that opportunity to, to actually look each other in the eye. You wanna keep those kinds of meetings really short, no longer than 30 minutes, maybe as short as 15. Um, before you go into this, you wanna practice what you wanna talk about and be sure to follow up again with a thank you note and with resources. Um, it's amazing how often that, that follow-up note, whether it's via email or snail mail, um, can really make an impact because it's something you kind of assume everyone does, but in reality, they don't. Um, to set up a newsroom meeting, just reach out to the news director or to a general manager to find out if these types of meetings are even allowed. Um, in a non-COVID situation, uh, ask if you can bring light snacks like bagels or coffee, um, but always ask before you do it. While you're there, if you're able to do this in person, stop by the desks of the journalists. Don't just go to the people who are on air um, if you're at a TV station. Uh, stop by the desk of the assignment editors and the producers as well. So those are always really, again, taking that extra step and showing interest. Another way to engage journalists is to ask the outlet to be a media sponsor. Um, Tara refers to the fact that when she was a journalist in Kansas City, her TV station was actually the media sponsor for the American Heart Association. So during Heart Month, they covered the events, any news items, they ran commercials, and all of that was free. But because that relationship was established between Tara and the communications director in that local office, um, anytime she had a story or any kind of information that had to do with heart health or with stroke, if she needed additional input or she needed to find a survivor or a physician, that's who she reached out to first. So remember, engaging with editors and journalists is always an investment of time, but it's one that pays off. Um, and I completely agree. Um, building relationships with journalists and editors can make a huge difference in your success in media relations. So not only do those established relationships help support news coverage of your cause, they also build support for your cause by the editorial staff. So um, I want to start by you know, explaining that there is a difference, first of all, in an editorial, in an op-ed or an LTE. They don't work the same way. They don't get produced the same way. So I'll start by explaining a little about how the editorial team works. Editorial staff from a media outlet often produce editorial content as well. So an editorial is gonna express an individual editor or a group, well, an individual editor's opinion on a certain topic or issue, depending on who is listed as the author. The editorial board or an edit, a editorial board editorial is actually the opinion of a group of that newspaper's editorial staff known as an editorial board. So this really differs from op-eds or opinion columns. Um, those are actually written by staff of the media outlet, whereas op-eds, letters to the editor, or guest editorials are written by people outside of that media outlet. Always keep in mind that the editorial board does not represent the opinion of the media outlet as a whole. With any media outlet, there should be a clearly defined line between the news coverage of that outlet and any issue that outlet covers and the writing on the editorial page. Now, often by reading the editorial page, you learn about the opinions, the personal lives, and the thoughts of the individual editors. So these can create opportunities to reach out and make a connection. 
By building relationships with individual editors, you can reach out to them personally with issues that are of importance to your organization that aligns with issues that are of interest to them. Um, when I think about that specifically, one of my college classmates from oh so many eons ago um, has just become an editorial page editor at the Tulsa World. And so from that perspective, I've been reading his editorials since that happened. And there are things that I knew about him already because we're friends and I've followed his social media accounts personally. Um, but now he's sharing with a broader audience things that are of interest to him, like um, he loves to hike, he loves to run, he loves to be active and engaged in things going on in Tulsa. So, you know, if we were working on something that addressed um, complete streets or made the city more walkable or bikeable, that would absolutely be something I would want to reach out to him about and start building that broader relationship, even if I didn't know him personally. So we're gonna take another um, step and dig a little deeper into the editorial board. So as I said earlier, the editorial board is a group of journalists who collectively write and manage these pieces, editorial board editorials, to express the joint opinions of the board as a whole. Editorial boards can weigh in on everything from a really hyper local issue like city ordinances under discussion, traffic problems, the quality of the water in the community or the bikeability of a neighborhood. But they also weigh in on statewide or national issues, including the federal budget and anything in between. The board is comprised of writers, editors, and in some cases, the newspaper executives. At a large paper, an editorial staff can include multiple writers who cover specific beats, while at a small paper, the editorial board might include only two people, an editor and a writer. So, you know, you have to dig in and learn a little bit about how those editorial boards are set up and how to best reach them. Again, as a reminder, the editorial and the news sections of a paper should be separate and distinct. They each have their own staff and neither should influence the other's coverage. The news section is expected to be unbiased and objective, while the ed editorial section is absolutely not set up that way. Um, so, you know, the next question is about meeting with an editorial board. What is, what is the goal that you want in, in determining this process? So the very first thing we wanna know um, is what's our goal? And that goal when you're having an editorial board meeting is to influence the outlet's opinion of your campaign. So just because you can get a meeting doesn't mean you'll get positive coverage or any coverage at all. So at a minimum, what it can do is allow you to present your campaign's point of view. Even if that just starts from sending the pitch for the editorial board meeting. So I hope that makes sense. Um, but if you're following the writing on the editorial pages, it can give you a really good idea of the different personalities of different board members. And this information can help you make your case for getting the meeting scheduled at all. So before you do an editorial board meeting, you want to do your research. Um, research the newspaper, learn about as, as much as you can about the paper, who reads that paper, um, and what the paper has covered of this issue previously, both on the news side and on the editorial side. So ask yourself the following questions and see if you can find the answers to them. Has this issue been covered by the news team in the past? If so, by whom? Have they published any opinion or editorial pieces on this issue? If so, were they favorable or unfavorable to your point of view? 
who should you talk, who should talk to the board? So the very first time I worked on an editorial board meeting was back in the days when I was at a different nonprofit in Austin, Texas, and we were working on Smoke Free Austin. Um, one of the opposition arguments we really heard is that, you know, Austin was the live music capital of the world and that making the city smoke free was absolutely going to ruin um, the live music scene. So we knew if we were going to get to have a visit with the editorial board, it was going to be really important for us to bring a musician and a bar owner. So think about that. What are the biggest oppositions? What are some people who are going to have a unique point of view? Um, if the... Um, if the request is favorable, you, you get that, um, that editorial, that ask. And as you look at who, um, what coverage has been done of the issue, if those things were addressed, your concerns were addressed, um, think about ways you can reinforce that. If the coverage was unfavorable, so for example, we had seen some coverage that really showed some concern about what this was going to do to the live music scene. Well, we found some specific ways that we could effectively rebut those concerns. When it comes to actually setting up a meeting, there's some more questions to act, um, ask yourself regarding the timing of it. Um, is this a, something that would be appropriate to like even build the idea about doing an editorial board meeting um, before your campaign launches? I mean, is it good to just get it out there, get the community talking about this issue? Um, is it the right time right as you're launching or right after you've launched your campaign? Or is it more important to have this kind of coverage at a time when you expect a significant milestone in your campaign? So before, for example, an important um, committee vote. So with all of this knowledge pulled together, you write a pitch letter to the editorial board and ask for a meeting. And it's a lot like writing a pitch letter to a journalist for news coverage. You need to make sure that you're providing the important questions that you're hitting the points that are gonna make them interested. So once you've actually secured the invite for your editorial board meeting, so you're gonna send your, your invite, you're gonna offer to follow up. You actually, if you haven't heard back, you do that follow up with an email or a phone call um, to the editor. The, the next thing you need to do is to start preparing for your meeting. So during the meeting, you need to be prepared. So come prepared with an agenda and make sure that you've run through it a few times in advance. Um, typically these meetings, don't you don't just bring one person. So you need to know who is gonna be speaking and when, and again, practice that. Different outlets have different formats for their editorial board meeting, but they'll let you know in advance what to expect. While most often you'll bring in your team and have a discussion with the board, just your team with a one-on-one discussion, um, I had a very different experience with the Seattle Times a couple of years ago when we were working on a sugary, well, when there was a ballot initiative trying to preempt sugary drink taxes at the local level. Um, what they did is they actually invited both sides of the issue to come in and it was almost like a debate where they asked us questions and one side got to respond and then the other could could state their opinion or where they disagreed and what was even more different in this situation is that um they actually filmed the the inner the meeting and put it on their website so other people could view. So everyone is going to be a little different, but again, they're going to tell you what to expect. It is important that you keep in mind, whatever the format of that meeting, is that everything said during an editorial board meeting is on the record. You are speaking with the media. 
And you need to be flexible. While it's important to have stuff prepared, it's also possible that they're gonna have their own idea for how things should run once you get in there. Be persistent. At the close of the meeting, ask the editor if he or she finds the issue interesting and if it could be something for their editorial pages. Keep in mind that the board might need additional time to make up a decision. And if so, include this question in your follow-up. And then finally, Afterward, um, after your meeting, again, always say thank you. Follow up with to the editorial board, board as quickly as possible, ideally within 24 hours. Thank them for their time. Be sure to include a recap of the conversation and highlight any key takeaways. You can also use this opportunity to share links to materials that you handed out in the meeting or any additional resources that you didn't bring but you'd like for them to have. And then finally, follow up when appropriate. Follow up with them as your campaign continues to reach new milestones and when the paper covers the issue area. The final piece of information I'd like for you to think about um, when it comes to an editorial board meeting is where you choose to ask for an editorial or an editorial board meeting. You'll want to make sure you really think that out. Um, the most important question is who needs to see the information? So, for example, um, oftentimes the media outlet in the state's capital may not be the largest one, and California is a great example of that. The Sacramento Bee, located in the state capital, has a weekly circula weekday circulation about a fifth of the size of the circulation of the LA Times. But I expect that every single person in the state capitol building reads the Sacramento Bee every day. So another, you know, so that balances who is your audience? Is it the public where the LA Times circulation really might be more effective or is it that more um, focused uh, audience of state decision makers? Another consideration, will the policy you're trying to pass impact a particular population more than others? So a great example of that is a tobacco flavors policy. We know that menthol cigarettes have been pushed in the black community by big tobacco for decades. And as a result, more than 80% of black people who smoke use menthol products. So in order to pass a flavors policy that includes menthol, it's going to be extremely important to have the support of Black leaders in the community and build awareness among the Black community. So in Kansas City last year, or I guess it was earlier this year, instead of focusing their efforts um, on their flavors campaign in the Kansas City Star, they instead went to the Kansas City Globe, which is a newspaper that was established in 1972 specifically to serve the Black residents of the Kansas City metro area. Now I'm going to pass the baton back over to Tara, and she's going to talk about other kinds of pieces on the opinion pages. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining. So um, shall we go to the next slide? And we're going to talk a little bit about op-eds versus LTE. So the op-ed um, is a little bit of what Shelly just talked about. Um, but in general, the topic has a broad interest. Um, maybe you have a new angle or a new idea when it's related to the topic. And you have a lot to say about it. Where an LTE or a letter to the editor, it's something that the outlet has already mentioned and you're writing a response to it. Maybe you wanna provide additional support to what a journalist has already written about, or maybe you wanna rebut and provide some new information or an alternate point of view. Um, and then this is something that's a much tighter, much shorter. It's something that you can express your idea in fewer words, think 150 to 250 words. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, oh, 250 words, that's, that's nothing. I could write that easily. What you'll notice when you start writing these LTEs, I just wanna give a word of caution, is especially if you're interested or very passionate about the issue, you're easily gonna get to 400, 500, 600 words. And so you're gonna have to rein yourself in a little bit. 
let me dive a little bit deeper into each of these to help you figure out maybe which one is going to work for you and the campaigns that you're either working on now or will be working on with the start of the new legislative session. So let's pop to the next slide, Shelly. Um, so the op-ed. Before you get started on your own op-ed, a couple of things that you really should keep top of mind. First of all, choose your signer carefully. This is the person who is going to author the op-ed. Now, in some cases, you might actually have your advocate or your volunteer, or your employee write the op-ed. Um, this is great if they are comfortable with that type of thing or if they have experience with writing. Other times, you might have to ghost write it yourself. Regardless, whoever is going to put their name on that op-ed, um, you want to make sure it's someone who can grab, grab the audience's attention, make sure readers are interested in what they have to say. Is it an, a high influential, highly influential or high profile person who can sign this, someone with some name cachet? Um, make sure that the, the influencer or the person um, is well known in your community. Um, it could be someone like a doctor, a researcher, a teacher, um, someone with, you know, MD or a uh, master of science after their name, but it doesn't have to be that type of person. I know that when I work with my grantees, they're often, they want to get the expert opinion and have that expert draft the op-ed. It doesn't have to be someone with a PhD or an MD or an MS after their name. It can also be a parent, a school principal, um, a politician. I've even uh, coached some kids on how they could come up with their own voice uh, to write in and in an op-ed. Um, so make sure you're keeping that signer top of mind because they're going to be able to influence opinions that read this. Um, write like you talk, avoid jargon. This is especially important for when you do have those PhDs and MDs. Remind them that the average person reading the op-ed is not going to be someone um, who maybe has a higher level of education. And even if they do, they may not be experts in that issue. So make sure they're writing like they talk. Avoid fancy words, avoid slang, um, and try and, and narrow your opinion. Um, many of the topics we work on have a really wide area of knowledge. Narrow it down um, to just one or two talking points. That way your audience can really truly understand what you're talking about. Um, on that note, make sure you're getting to the point. Make your key points early and often, and then back them up with facts and examples. If you have a personal short story, share it. Um, one, one that I really like, we work with a pediatrician in Maryland, and um, she often tells the story about how she was treating a little girl for pre-diabetes, a little girl about elementary school age. Uh, her grand, wonder if she had lost a grandparent, to diabetes, both of her parents had diabetes. Um, they were concerned that she was going down the same road and she opened, at the very end of their meeting together, she opened up a can of pop and drank it inside the doctor's office. Um, she shares this story when we're, when we're trying to talk about how do we limit children's sugar intake and get them to drink you know, water or low fat milk. And so she often shares that story. Do you have that personal story or do you have an advocate who can share that perspective? If so, include it in, in the, in the op-ed that you're writing. Um, be prepared to be edited and don't take it personally. Uh, op-ed submissions, they are going to be subject to review and editing um, either for content or even just length. They might wanna shorten it. And then lastly, always include your contact information. Include your name, your title, your organization, your email, and your phone number. In case editors want to reach out to you and contact you, um, it, they may not want to run your op-ed, but you might be talking about something interesting and they need an issue area expert uh, to weigh in later down the road. Including that contact information just means that that's just another pathway to ensure that you, you know, you're creating that contact, that journalist that you can go to should you have stories down the line. Now let's take a look at uh, the anatomy of a letter to the editor on the next slide. So we can see how they're a little bit different. So in the sense that you're still sharing an opinion and a point of view, it is similar to an op-ed. However, letter to the editor is a little different because it's offering a unique opportunity to reach uh, 
uh, perspective readers of that out of that either online outlet or that newspaper by offering your expertise, your point of view. Excuse me. And so you might write in, you might read something in, in the newspaper and say, I'm going to write an L a letter to the editor on that. You can agree with what was written and provide additional supporting uh, facts, or you can disagree and provide those supporting facts. A reminder, a plug to the American Heart Association website and also Voices for Healthy Kids. We've got fast facts there that you can use in your letters to the editor to um, support or, or re rebut what was said uh, maybe in a, a news article. So first step is make sure that you are visiting the newspaper website to figure out how do you submit that LTE. Pay close attention to the directions. Some are gonna limit you to 150 words. Some are gonna limit you to 250 words. Um, some are gonna ask you to fill out an online form and submit your LTE there, while others might ask you to actually email one of the editors. Uh, again, make sure you're including your contact information. The newspaper will probably wanna verify your identity before they publish anything. Um, and then again, it's just another way to continue conversation down the road in case they don't use your letter to the editor so they have your contact info. Now, once you've decided, yes, I am going to submit this letter to the editor to XYZ publication, be concise. These are short, no more than 250 words. Um, remember, sooner the better. This isn't something that you can wait a week on. And I know that's hard. Often with large organizations like the American Heart Association, we have so much, so many approval processes in place. So you, as soon as you know you want to write that op-ed, start getting your ducks in a row. The window is narrow, a day to two days. After two days, people have moved on from whatever was written that you wanted to, to write a response to, and your window may have closed. Um, make sure you're connecting the dots. Mention the original article in, in your original piece of content and uh, how, how your facts uh, relate to whatever was written before. So just make sure that readers are going to see that connection. If you can share a personal story, this is another way to do it. Just keep in mind, you've got a much more abbreviated set of words to do it in. And then lastly, make it relevant to people. Can you localize the issue? Can you insert some local facts um, or st uh, statistics? Uh, you can find often find a lot of local information on your local uh, county or state health department website. Um, and again, those fast facts on our website should be helpful to you. Go ahead and go to that last slide, Shelly, on the components of a compelling message. And so regardless of whether you're writing an op-ed or a letter to the editor, or even something beyond that, like a blog or a press release, there are five elements that we often talk about when we do our spokesperson trainings. The problem, the solution, the ask, the urgency, and the hope. These are elements that should be included in, if not every uh, piece of original content, most pieces of original content. Um, so just remember, you know, your, your problem um, is, you know, like, let's say it, it, food insecurity for, for young people, and we want to have um, universal school meals or healthy school meals for all. Um, our solution would be to create some type of, of bill to support that. Are asked in a letter to the editor or the op-ed, it could be something as simple as, you know, signing up for a newsletter or liking us on Facebook, but it could be something, you know, more action oriented, like, you know, writing to um, uh, the school board or writing to a senator to ask them to sign on to the bill. Um, when it comes to the ask, you just want to make sure lobbying versus non-lobbying. So just be wary of that. Urgency is always important when you're doing original content, especially when you're going to be asking people to do things or asking people to care about things. Why is this matter urgent now? What can you tie it to? This is especially relevant um, for the op-ed. The letter to the editor, it's urgent because it's just been written about in the newspaper or on an online outlet and you're responding to that. But the op-ed, if you don't make it have some kind of news peg or some kind of urgency, it might reduce your chance of actually getting it published. Um, so thinking about, is there an upcoming vote? 
or is it the start of the legislative session? Is school starting if you're doing something school related? Um, you know, something that I, I saw last year um, with sugary, we, we had a sugary drink uh, campaign in Maryland uh, in November last year. And one of the news pegs they used was Halloween and Halloween trick or treat candy. And, um, you know, the candy isn't always the worst offender. It's what you drink the other 364 days of the year. So thinking about that. And then lastly, hope. Hope is what gives people that motivation. It, 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 it adds that little glimmer. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. The hope enables people to feel like they can act. So if we pass this legislation, if we support this idea, what do we have? What stands to be gained? How will the world be better? How will our community improve? Thinking of that, and that's often a great last line to include. Um, in your, in your letter to the editor or your op-ed is providing people with that glimmer of hope of what stands to be gained if we can have success in whatever policy we're, we're pushing at that moment. Um, Shelly, if you'll go to the next slide, I just want to, before we move on to questions, comments, um, maybe input that you all have, I want to take a moment just to plug our evaluation process. Uh, you can take a picture using your cell phone. You just open up your camera app. You shine it uh, right at this QR code. It'll take you to a website. That's where we keep our evaluations. We ask that everyone attending today just quickly fill this out. It doesn't take more than a couple of minutes. This is key for our funding. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Andrea also put it in the chat for you. Um, this is key to our funding. Our funders like to know what we're, what we're providing. They also like to know what the people attending think. And so it would be really helpful if you could just take a couple of minutes to fill that out for us while we move on to questions and comments. So next slide, Shelley, just to remind folks, this is your time to ask us anything you might have about letters to the editor, um, op-eds or other pieces of, maybe other pieces of content that you want some help writing. You can come off mute or you can put it in the chat. And while we wait in case anybody has any of those questions, Shelly, I had a quick question for you. Um, when you were comparing the LA Times versus the Sacramento Bee, I think that naturally, you know, you want to get to the widest audience. And so LA Times seems like a like a no brainer, but you proved to us that, you know, it's not always who has the most reach, but who has the most relevancy. So my question is, what's the best way to figure, how do you figure that out? How do you know when you live in an area that has um, multiple newspapers or multiple outlets, a place like LA, New York, DC, how do you know which one do you pitch to? Well, I mean, you know, I think the really, the, the answer to that question is, you know, who are you trying to reach? And then you look at the audience of the of the newspaper. So an example, I'm about to send out some emails shortly um, around a federal issue that we're asking. We've got a pitch letter, an editorial board pitch letter um, signed by Nancy Brown, our CEO and our chair of the board um, in support of. Uh, surprise medical billing act that was or law that was passed last year, but it's it's in the process of being implemented. Um, that the final rules are going to be written um, on that. So we're targeting some some specific publications that are important to the decision makers. Um, so so that's how we made that choice. They're not the biggest newspapers across the country, um, but they're really targeted and thoughtful about where we want to go. And along with that, um, Tanya asked um, in the in the chat box if we have examples of a pitch letter. And we do. Um, we have we'll send out a document at the end that's got some some tips, a tip sheet on editorial board visits. And on that document, it's got a sample pitch letter um, with some suggestions on how you would personalize that and really make it your own. Um, but yeah, a good sample. Thanks for asking about that. So Tara, um, my question for you is what do you think um, is, is the most difficult piece of writing a letter to the editor? 
That's a great question. So I think two things. First is finding that signer, finding the person who has the knowledge, the lived experience that you really want to convey. Um, and so in this instance, this is why it's so important to have a list of spokespeople that you can rely on. Um, thinking of, you know, oftentimes when we think spokespeople, we think people who are gonna be inter uh, interviewed by the media, but your spokespeople can also do things like letters to the editor. So finding someone who has that unique perspective. And again, I just wanna reiterate, just because working with grantees, they always wanna have that MD or that PhD, but one of the best op-eds that I've seen one of our grantees do was actually from a parent writing from her perspective um, she was. She wrote an op-ed for some complete streets legislation we were working to do in California and wrote about how when she was a kid, she rode her bike to school. She could ride her bike to the store. She could ride her bike to her friend's houses. Didn't have to worry. Nowadays, streets are built for cars, not for pedestrians or people who bike or roll. Um, and so she wrote from her perspective and the fears she had as a parent um, of letting her son even bike to school because he had to go across the highway. It was so moving reading her words. So uh, number one, finding that good signer is going to be a little bit of a challenge. And then also when it comes to an op-ed, finding, you know, we are working year round to, um, pa you know, pass policy, whether we're doing the ground softening or, you know, there's an actual vote coming up. And so figuring out when is the opportune time to pitch that op-ed um, and, and with the high chance, not only of it getting published, but also making the most waves. And so you've really got to examine when is the most opportune time for your campaign. What I suggest doing is making a list of, of deadlines, for example. So starting at the farthest deadline, let's say uh, in May, we want to pass this policy. And then thinking of all the things we need to do along the way, leading up to May, um, to get that policy passed. That might help you figure out when the most opportune time is to try and pitch that op-ed. Maybe it's right before a vote, or maybe it's right before a, a committee meeting of some kind. Um, or is there a holiday coming up? Um, but, but, you know, finding the perfect time will not only increase the likelihood of it being published, but also, you know, increase the likelihood of gaining some real action uh, from the people who read it. Thanks. Those are, I mean, these are always great tools, but there are challenges that come along with each one of them. So thanks for those thoughts. Um, Marvin just asked, um, how would a lay person determine a newspaper's audience just by looking at it? Um, and I'll tell you the first thing, Google is your friend. So if you just do a quick search, um, if you know what city you're working in, but you want to look for minority serving media outlets, you can just search that you can search, you know, black owned newspaper in X city. Um, if you know a newspaper like in the state capital, um, you know, Google it and you find out what their readership is. I mean, you're going to know just based on, you know, if you're trying to reach state level decision makers, that's an easy way to do it. Um, another, you know, whatever media outlets are in that capital city. Um, the other big question is, you know, if you're looking at a state legislature, you know, where is that key decision maker, that targeted decision maker, where do they live? And they may be from a rural community with a weekly newspaper. Um, so a really small newspaper, really small media outlet. Um, but that's what's going to influence them because their neighbors, their constituents, that's what they're going to be reading. Um, so, you know, the, those questions really come back to, you know, who do we need to influence? In some markets, on some issues, it may be the business journal. That may be, you know, that city's business publication. That may be the outlet. Um, and if you're really some of the things we don't think about as being um, media outlets, uh, patch.com, which is a hyper local um, media service, really, 
Um, and you can just send your own stuff there, but it's neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, so when I say look at the newspaper's audience or look at the media outlet, it's really thinking about who are we trying to influence, what media outlets exist, where they are, and then think about you know, who's going to be reading those just in general. If it's something about schools, maybe you don't want to go to the business journal. Um, but if it's something around hospitals or the medical field, then the business journal may be a great place to go. And a lot of what's helpful is to get online and look at the, the what, they're, um, what they're currently publishing. Um, and that's going to give you an idea of their readers that they're trying to reach. Tara, any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I was just going to exactly what you just said at the very end there is look and see what they've done before. Have they published um, op eds, LTEs, or even just news articles on the topics that you're writing about? It doesn't have to be identical, but have they published similar themes? If they have, um, then maybe they're the one you should pitch to. Well, we are bumping up to the end of our time. Um, so any other questions? Look at me, seven seconds of silence to make sure no one was gonna speak up. Okay, Tara, I think then are we ready to um, say our final thank yous? Yeah, thanks everyone so much for attending. I just put our contact information in the chat. Uh, feel free to take a screen grab of that and reach out to us beyond this training. Um, if you find that next year, 2022, hard to believe it's creeping up on us, um, that you are in the middle of legislative session and you want to write an op-ed or an LTE and you just don't know what next step to do and you're stuck, email us. We are more than happy to help you. And with that, um, thank you so much for attending. I hope everyone has a wonderful, wonderful afternoon and a very happy holiday season, regardless of whatever holiday you are celebrating. Um, may it be a really happy, joyous time for you. And um, we will kick this training series off again in the new year. Hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.